Colleagues, we'll take the closing of doors as an invitation to start this afternoon's session. And could I welcome you back to a session with, I think, the intriguing but equally provocative title of Emerging Powers, Emerging Dissension in uh, International Development. I'm Ian Diamond from the University of Aberdeen. And the plan of campaign this afternoon is that Deborah will speak uh, in a moment or two for around 10 minutes and set the scene, uh, raise the, a number, I'm sure, of extremely important and interesting issues. We will then move straight into a discussion. So the floor will be yours for a decent debate. I will bring in my colleagues around me uh, to answer uh, the questions and also to, to interject uh, around the overall um, topic. So that's the plan. Let me, without further ado, then invite Professor Deborah Brautigan from Johns Hopkins University. Deborah's had an absolutely stellar career, uh, and I think we're all looking forward to listening to her this afternoon. Deborah. Thank you very much. Let me set my timer here. Start. All right. Um, I didn't quite realize that I was going to be setting off uh, for all, doing all the talking, at least uh, for this session, on emerging powers and emerging dissension and in international development. Uh, as some people in the room may know, uh, my own specialty is on China, and particularly China and Africa. So that's what I know, and that's what I'm going to focus on more than talking about Turkey and South Africa and India and so on. So uh, I want to make four points in my 10 minutes here. And the first is about China's idea of development and development cooperation. The second is about Chinese instruments for this development cooperation. The third is on the dimensions, how big a development cooperator is China. And then the risks and the benefits of the Chinese model. And I'll focus the last part of uh, what I'm saying on this these Chinese package deals or this Chinese bundling of different elements of uh, engagement together, which was what I was asked to address. So first of all, uh, to preface these remarks, let me pick up on something that Stephen Chan talked about earlier, which is uh, China fever. So that I find in any discussion about what the Chinese are doing, there is this uh, sense, there's so much media attention to China. Um, so that we have an exaggerated idea of their engagement in, in many dimensions in Africa, is certainly the case there. So China's idea of development and development cooperation. I do think that this, this does present some challenges. There are some, some significant differences in how China sees this. There, uh, on the one hand, one could say that China's own, own view of development is fairly simple. There's a saying in China, if you want to become prosperous, first build a road. So it's, you know, you start with infrastructure. Uh, and then move on from there. And I think that's when we look at their engagement in Africa, it's very much focused around infrastructure. So we can see that. It's a very simple idea uh, of, of development. And, but there's, another, there's, of course, more to it than that. Um, I see very much a kind of uh, recognition and an embracing of the idea that there are stages to development. And so if you're a development theorist, if you hark back to uh, ideas such as uh, Rostow's stages of growth or, or other ideas that we call modernization theory, in some ways the way the Chinese think about it is very much along those lines, that things develop in stages and there aren't necessarily uh, things that are, there's much less that's sort of global and universal in how countries should behave or, or act. Um, so things like social and environmental standards, governance, uh, the things that you do in your economic policy, how open you should be, that these things should be gradual, they should change, and they should be staged. Another aspect about the development idea is that foreign aid doesn't have a big role. If you look at how China has developed, it hasn't developed on the basis of getting a lot of foreign aid. Certainly foreign aid has been a component. Uh, part of that has been more the transfer of ideas and, and uh, experiments and how to do things. But uh, China's development was based on, on China and Chinese. And, um, so they also, when they look outward, they don't see foreign aid as having a big role in their development cooperation or in other countries' developments. But although foreign aid doesn't have a big role in the Chinese model, it's very clear that the state does. And so um, as I think John Eikenberry said earlier this morning, uh, China is part of a region in which the developmental state is a kind of mode for uh, how they think about economic growth and economic change. And so China follows in a different way, but in a similar pattern with Japan, Korea, Taiwan, other places that have employed this mode. Um, Another point about China's idea about development is that it's consistent. Um, there's a consistency in this simple pattern of uh, you have infrastructure, you focus on agriculture first, then you go into manufacturing, and then uh, high-level services. 
Um, and this is very different from Western views of how countries should develop, which have uh, changed decade by decade. In the 1960s, of course, we were focused very much on um, uh, infrastructure, uh, industry, as uh, building up electricity uh, capacity, these kinds of things as how to do development. In the 70s, it was integrated rural development. In the 80s, it became structural adjustment. In the 90s, we added governance. And now it's the Millennium Development Goals and, and governance continues as well. So our uh, magic bullet for development changes every decade, but the Chinese have been fairly consistent since 1978. Of course, under Mao, they had some different ideas. Another aspect about the Chinese idea of development and development cooperation is that they really believe in this mutual benefit idea. And it's not just as, as Johnny Carson caricatured it as uh, China is in Africa for China. Um, they realize that if it's not mutual, if the benefits aren't mutual, it's not sustainable. So their own interests and their own commercial uh, aspirations, if they don't also benefit the uh, developing countries that they partner with, um, it won't be sustainable. So this mutual benefit is important. And then finally, they don't, this point was also made this morning, but they don't export. They don't want to export their model. And that's very unlike us in the West who believe that we really have something to teach and we have a, a teacher role. So my second area is uh, Chinese instruments for development cooperation. Now, uh, they have all the, the same kinds of instruments that we have, grants, uh, concessional loans, and so on. These are, for the most part, small in terms of the outward engagement. Um, and they're, the grants and the zero interest loans are focused very much on diplomacy. So these are elements of uh, building China's soft power. They do these prestige projects. They build uh, the equivalent of the White House for African presidents. And these are wonderful aspects of Chinese foreign policy where every time a president goes into his, his house or the next president comes in there, they look and see this was built as a gift from the people of China. So this is, uh, for them, a very good use of their foreign aid budget. Um, that's not how we look at foreign aid. And clearly, that can present some challenges for us. Uh, but let me go into the area that, um, that Philip asked me to talk about today, which is these bundling packages and the idea that, um, that China, Inc. coordinates all of this. So um, from Beijing. And I'm afraid that I've contributed a bit to this view in, in some of my writings, because I have talked about how the Chinese wanted to, in the 1990s, they approached this idea of uh, bundling aid, trade, and investment all together. And there was this, this uh, emphasis on this. But, but I do think that it's been over, um, uh, it's not quite so clear and not quite so bundled as, as all of that. Now, the things that we do see that are bundled are, um, for example, the Chinese have these, this, in Africa, there's a forum on China-Africa cooperation. So every three years, there's this big meeting in which they make all these kinds of pledges. And then all of these things, aid and trade and investment, all of these get um, bundled together in these pledges. So that's one way we think of it. And the second is that um, it's very common for the Chinese to have these signing ceremonies where a Chinese high-level official will come to a country and they, they wait and hold on to all the different things, trade deals, investment deals, aid deals, uh, finance, and they sign them all together. And so some people might think these were all negotiated as part of a package, and that's not the case. But the third area is this very interesting area of natural resource-linked package loans. And um, a lot of people, I quote something, a lot of people think these are very common. And uh, I quote something I, I saw a couple of days ago. Many of the Chinese contracts in Africa lay down uh, that payments be made in natural resources. So it actually, um, and then there's this idea that Beijing is pulling all the strings and, and coordinating all this. And so you read about China did this and China did that. Well, um, it's not actually the case. First of all, it's not the case that uh, it's very common. And uh, we can elaborate this more. But in uh, work that I've been doing on Chinese finance in Africa, there's so far from 2000 to 2011, I've documented uh, about 52 billion in loans, loan commitments. That's 288 loans and lines of credit across Africa. And out of this, and these are in most countries in Africa, um, out of this, only seven countries have had one of these resource package loans that uh, we've heard about for Angola or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And that's about 22 to 23 billion over the same 11 years. So it's, it's a big chunk of what is going in there, um, but it's not very many cases. So, um, and several other countries have had individual projects, like, like Ghana had the buoy dam, which was secured with cocoa beans. So that would also be this kind of package. Now, um, this package, I can describe it for the DRC. 
Now, we, we hear China went into the DRC and developed this big, uh, what was going to be a $9 billion package that was going to involve uh, a mine that would then produce copper, and this would repay two tranches of $3 billion each for loans. Now, this became quite controversial because the IMF and the World Bank were very against this, and so uh, Congo was trying to get debt relief, and so they, they held the package hostage until it was reduced and until um, the interest rate was fixed to make it a concessional uh, level of interest. So, um, so was this China coming in? Well, first of all, I talked to the, one of the people that had been there uh, negotiating this package originally, and he worked for the China Railway Engineering Corporation, CREC. Um, CREC and Sinohydro, two big Chinese companies, were the ones behind this. And they developed this package together with the Minister of Infrastructure uh, in the Congo as something that was company-driven. And so the idea was they were there, they wanted to do more work, Congo couldn't pay for it, so how could they come up with a way in which they could get more projects and uh, Congo could pay for them? So this was their package, and then they, sh they uh, shopped this to the China Exim Bank which uh, after years of discussions of all of these things agreed to finance at least part of it. And the rest is financed out of a, uh, a combination of other uh, lines of credit that come through, through the companies largely. So this is, um, it wasn't China that went there, it was Chinese companies that developed this and then they got the finance. That's my um, timer saying that I'm done. <laughs> You're going great guns, Deborah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually getting fairly close to the end. So. These loans are looked at as being quite mysterious. People don't know how they work. Um, it's not that hard to unpack them. In fact, I remember talking to uh, the IMF res rep in the Congo about the Congolese loan, and he said, you know, it's been hell for us to try to get anything out of the Chinese or the Congolese about this. And I said, well, that's really funny because I have the contract. I downloaded it from the internet. And he said, well, I know, I have it too. But he said, officially, they won't give it to us. <laughs> So um, they're sometimes less mysterious than we, we put out. And they're also not, it's not the Chinese uh, alone that use this kind of mechanism. Um, as I've often uh, given talks about uh, my work on China and Africa, I often start out with a, a story about um, a large country just emerging from conflict that decided to focus on development and had a, a, a visit from a major Asian power that had already become a consumer of their oil. And they made this uh, deal for a $10 billion line of credit that would be repaid by oil. And then I asked people, well, which countries were these? And, uh, and the people would say, Angola, Sudan. And it's actually Japan and China. So this was in the late 1970s. And Deng Xiaoping laid out this vision in a, in a speech in 1975 about how China could use its oil and its coal and its other resources to secure finance from abroad. So uh, it's a, a model that's very long standing. The World Bank has used this in the Chad Cameroon pipeline, for example, using an escrow account in Europe to repay the loan to the World Bank. So um, the last point I'll make on, on this packaged kind of deal, which again, as I say, is relatively rare. Uh, in, uh, it's happened in the Congo Brazzaville, the DRC, Equatorial Guinea, Ethiopia, Angola, Ghana, and the Sudan. I believe that's the uh, seven countries. There are risks with this kind of finance, and I think uh, the, the lack of transparency on the part of the Chinese um, is uh, one that contributes to this perception of risk because uh, they have been very um, unforthcoming with information, and China Exim Bank, I don't know if uh, Wang Jianye is still here, but uh, he could tell us much more than I can tell you about these loans if he was willing to. So the lack of transparency creates some uh, issues about debt sustainability. My own view on this is that um, it's not that big of an issue, that the, these uh, package deals are very securely tied up with exports that are going out anyway. And so they're being repaid. Um, so they're not going to be loading these countries with big debts that they can't pay, which is what we did in the past. Um, they could contribute to white elephant projects. I think that's a real risk, uh, because I don't think the cost-benefit analysis is being done very carefully for a lot of these uh, big packages and the projects uh, financed under these. And collusive bidding, there's not a lot of competitive international tendering. There's none. Um, there's some Chinese bidding, but uh, collusive bidding is a real risk. Uh, cost, quality, all of these things need to be insured. Um, and it relies on country ownership, which is both a, a, a a risk and a benefit. So um, they'll fund what the country wants to fund or what the government wants to fund. And all of these are risks that we've faced in the past. And the World Bank in particular has faced them and, and it's now operating differently. And I think it's part of the worry there out of that we, we did these things in the past and we don't want the Chinese to make the same mistakes. But there are benefits too. And the benefit is huge that you, if you're a country that's poorly governed, 
and you've just come out of war, you can get your electricity repaired in Luanda. You can build, rebuild your sanitation systems. You can uh, put your roads and your bridges back together without waiting for the international community to sign off on your good governance. I think that's a benefit. Um, and your exports are going out anyway. All during the war uh, in Angola, the United States sent, if you want to put it that way, we sent billions and billions to Angola every year to pay for their oil, and we didn't make any of that turn into development. But the Chinese are making some of the oil that Angola sends to them is turning into development projects in Angola, and I think that's a good thing. It reduces embezzlement risk because the money doesn't go into the, for those exports, doesn't go into the, directly into the government, but goes into the projects. And it acts as an agency of restraint or, or a, a form of credible commitment for that government to focus uh, its resources on development. And I think those are the good side of that model. And I'm, I'm happy to discuss it further. And sorry I took up more than I should have in time. Thank you. Yeah, that was fantastic. <laughs> Respect, Deborah, sit down. But colleagues, we're going straight out to you. So questions, comments. Can I plead for clarity and for brevity uh, in your questions? But can I also ask that you may wish to uh, ask questions which, which move us beyond China and, in, and into other areas. So who'd like to start? A little post-lunch shyness, please. Thank you. Mark Foster, Independent Commission of Aid Impact. Um, just interested in terms of actually picking up on that last set of comments whether we've seen evidence of these Chinese infrastructure investments with a follow through in terms of thinking through livelihood, marketplace impacts, you know, when you build a road, when you build a port, when you build that, in terms of seeing their interest in those broader economic development activities after the event or not, and how much that's feeding into their thought processes as they choose what to do. Deborah. I just answer and, yeah. okay. Um, by and large, from what I've seen, these infrastructure projects that are financed under these lines of credit are what the host government wants to do. And in many instances, these are long-standing projects that have not been financed, that they've had out there that multiple feasibility studies have been done, and they've never been financed before. So the buoy dam is a good example of that. Um, and also because uh, the, uh, internet, the banks, the multilateral development banks, are not financing things like hydropower projects for the most part. So there are projects like that. Um, and then some of them are reconstruction after the war. Um, there are also telecoms projects. So it's not so much what the Chinese are saying, we want infrastructure here. It's more that the governments are saying, this is where we want to pave this road or we want to redo this road. Um, so it, it's, uh, there are, are examples of infrastructure that's uh, connected to a mining investment, but that's not these kinds of packages. Those are more traditional mine that has to have infrastructure around it. And that's not what I'm talking about here. These are a different kind of package where it's, it's secured by an export of some kind. Please. Uh, thank you, Deborah. Um, my name is Harry Verhoeven of the University of Oxford. Uh, quick question about you know, your, your claim that you know, China does not seek to export its model or its way of thinking about the world or about development in particular. Whereas I agree that obviously if the comparison is with some of the more ambitious uh, parts of the, of the Western liberal agenda, you're, you're obviously right. But I do think that you know, given the interest that there is in Chinese academia, in Chinese policy world, in discussing issues of soft power and talking about the China model and the China dream, um, also in cultivating strategic relations between the Chinese Communist Party and a whole series of African uh, political parties. Um, I was wondering whether you think that this is somehow a, a change or how, how you would categorize these things. Are these merely um, you know, realpolitik or commercially driven uh, partnerships and ways of thinking? Is this you know, merely to be categorized in that label or is, are we seeing something which is qualitatively different and where we are beginning to see perhaps a more, a more ideological uh, dimension to the, um, to the partnership? Deborah, if you respond there and then I'll move to Stefan Dirk on to say a few words. Deborah, please. All right. Um, I think it's very much a hypothesis that um, the, this level of engagement is qualitatively different. I think what we can say as fact is that it's quantitatively larger, but 
it's it's always been there. You know, the party to party relations have been there always, and the military engagement has been there always. And so it's just all ratcheted up. There's more of it now. Um, what they do in their uh, party to party engagement, I'm not. That's not what I've looked into. Um, so, but I I would think that it's. From what I've seen, there's not an effort, certainly there's nothing about, um, there's, there's an effort to try to get other countries to understand how China is. And so bringing people to China is much more, um, if there's any kind of experts, really much more of an imp importing people in, showing them what they do in China, uh, hoping that they get ideas from that about their own development and pick and choose, but not this effort to, um, to condition any of the engagement on becoming more like China. So that's why I put it. Stefan Dergel. Right. Um, I, I think I, I just wanted to, well, pick up on where Deborah uh, left it and actually uh, give a few comments. Uh, you know, from a point of view, say, look, I'm, I'm now chief economist at DFID. How, how do you now kind of respond to that kind of reality? Because I, I just want to first emphasize in terms of the basic analysis, there is very little that I actually tend to disagree with Eberon in terms of what is going on and how we may well want to think about it, but it doesn't make it easier for a development agency to try to respond to it. And I think this may be two points. So first of all, you know, why does it kind of really matter? And it, it, it helps briefly to so seen from, from our point of view, trying to do development in Africa, of how do, how do you respond to it? And the first thing I would want to say there is, um, you know, I think as, as this morning, uh, Professor Eikenberry had kind of mentioned is how they play, Chinese play the game of that, the game that, of which we've set a rule to perfection, so to speak. You know, they take in the opportunities in the sense of, in, in, in ways that we in a way have created. And I think that's actually very much the case in Africa. If you think it in a, and it's both a negative and a positive side. The negative side is, is that, you know, the fact that they can go in into sectors like natural resources, seemingly boundless, doing all kinds of things, stepping into political economies and playing them to their advantage, is arguably you know, an element of failure of, 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 of development that we've tried to achieve in these countries. At the same time, the fact that they are going there now is also time because there are lots of growth opportunities and not just natural resources. And there's a lot of things going on that actually is an element of the success of development that we've actually had in quite a lot of places. There is growth in Africa. There's macroeconomic stability, which is something that didn't exist in the 1980s and early 90s, and it's a big change, meaning it's actually an investment climate that this kind of investor can come into. So that's actually kind of thing. You know, we have, in a sense, we sow, we, we, we sowed all the, the seeds for it, together with African governments and, and the way we did it. Uh, we, we, we harvesting now somehow a very difficult thing, but maybe the thing to react, the way to think about and how to respond to it is to see, can we turn that positive to our advantage and our in terms of now as, 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 a, as a shared development interest and actually working more on that negative. And so the first reaction could be, and this is actually a typical reaction I think that bilateral aid agencies have done this now, for, for now. And so I'll illustrate it when I first asked when I was in DFID to some head of office in Uganda and said, you know, how, what, how does China matter for you? And he said flippantly, well, it used to be the case we could call the Minister of Finance and we could meet immediately. Now the Chinese get the best meetings. Um, but it's in a sense they're in our space. And that's the kind of thing, you know, let's, let's, let's ignore that they're there, but they're just there and they annoy us. Uh, the other one is to say, well, let's bring them in the tent, you know, full-heartedly and let them all sign up to the DACO OECD rules and everything and everything, you know. Look, there's, a, there's something there to be done and on the global stage try to bring them in into rule systems. But it's going to be quite tough and quite an interesting thing and we do this. I think the third one is, is probably the way we do it at the moment. I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a second. Um, the, the third one is we could just compete with them. And we could say, we'll take them on on their game, you know, show them. Show them, on the one hand, compete them in every market that we can. Let's do it, let's, let's take on the challenge, let's do it like in all the economic things, let's all get the things. At the same time, compete also on something that we stand for. You know, that we actually have a rights-based way of doing things, we have a set of values, a set of norms, working even much harder maybe on the, on the political economy reforms in these places, and ensuring that pure rent-seeking behavior becomes less possible, all the institutional, institutional change. I think there's a lot of positive to be said about it. And I think in a debate, that's probably where we are. Trying to say, well, maybe we should try to do this and show them that we better partner with the governments in Africa and say, you know, this is a, this is a better way of doing business and so on. I think there's one huge problem with this. 
This is basically non-economists designing economic policy. This is mercantilist views. It's basically deciding that economic matters are always a zero-sum games. And I assume there's lots of non-economists here. This is always the one thing that frustrates me with non-economists. They think of economies as zero-sum games. What you get, I can't have, and that's it. And this is the wrong way to think about what's happening in Africa. The fact that Africa is growing and gets prosperous creates opportunities to all, for all the partners that could actually deal with it. And that actually means there is a shared interest. And it's quite interesting that you talk about mutual interest there, because I do believe there's a strong mutual interest. There's an interest for us that actually there's growth in a prosperous, prosperous Africa. I think there is a strong interest for, for, um, for China that there's actually growth in a prosperous Africa, and that actually that is, that is growth, not just rents that are being captured because they, they stifle at some point, they stop. China has a huge manufacturing sector that's far too labor intensive that it's seeking to export. There's lots of opportunities in Africa and I kind of often say, partly jokingly, but partly serious, China will deliver the MDGs because they're really able to deliver jobs in a way probably that we may not be able to do so. We do not have the firms and industries to invest there to do so. So you do have a mutual interest of growing and prosperous Africa. Maybe on that principle, try to actually find ways of working with them around things that have to do with maybe you know, growth and prosperity agendas that are shared. You know, as DFID, actually we sometimes try, we try all kinds of things that we should do, you know, on all kinds of levels of global deals at more directly working with them. But one thing we're toying with, and I'm not saying that we will do it, uh, but for example, we have some fascinating contacts with the Chinese Development Bank, who are actually very interested in working together, because they want their in investments to have a good return in the long run. They don't just want to capture rents, they want infrastructure that are paid back and so on. And they said things like, you know, couldn't you help us with political risk analysis? Could you help us with social impact analysis? Could you help us with environmental risk analysis? It would be quite suitable. I can see their interest. I can also see our interest in doing these kind of things. Stefan, thank you very much. Please. Rachel Heyman from Intrac. Um, I'd be interested to hear from any or all of the panel on um, how emerging powers are supporting or not the development of civil society in, through their international development work. David, do you want to say a few words? Um, i trying to think if anybody else can, can say it better. Uh, no, put me on the, the spot a little bit on that. Um, I don't know whether they are directly supporting civil society. I can come across much evidence of that, but they have changed the nature of the game and the environment in which those conversations occur. Um, obviously, that's sometimes interpreted by traditional aid donors in a negative light because some of the things that Stefan's just talking about, uh, the arrival of the emerging powers, and particularly of China and Africa, does give national governments more choice. Their bargaining position is improved so that it's not as easy to impose conditions such as you must do certain things for, um, um, for civil society. Um, one was trying to look for support of that, and then I suppose in Africa a number of governments do look as though they're tightening up on NGO regulations in ways that would be s seen as negative from a liberal democratic perspective. So uh, the evidence might suggest that that is allowing civil society to be marginalised, but that would be very tentative. Thank you. Emma, Emma Mosley. Yeah, I think it's very hard to have a definitive answer on this. Uh, the Gulf states, which we've not talked at all about today, um, are certainly perhaps more supportive of civil society through the Red Crescent and other forms of Islamic aid than many others. We see shifts, very interesting changes in India, uh, and I know there are people here today who are involved in that, with Oxfam and others uh, in a uh, civil society, new civil society forum that's opened up between uh, the development administration, the new development administration in India. And it's a cautious forum, taking slow steps, but there's, there's doors are maybe opening. Uh, whether that means they're going to be co-opted, become a critical friend and voice is a whole another question. And I think what we see actually is also civil society organizing itself in response to this new development landscape. So there are, uh, we can think of Brazilian NGOs like Connectas and, and others who are actively thinking about Brazil's role as a development partner and the responsibilities that Brazilian civil society might have in trying to both deal with domestic issues of justice and inclusive growth, but also how that is externally projected out. Um, so I, I think that uh, by and large, I mean, when we think of civil society in the Western-led international development effort, of course, 
highly varied, but it's been very strongly produced by Western narratives, financing, and you know, it's, it's of course it's enormously diverse and and has plenty of agency and insurgency within it. But nonetheless, it's going to be very interesting, I think, to see how what is uh, quite in many countries a large part of it has been classically funded and shaped by Western expectations and ideologies. How that's going, how those civil society organisations, particularly development NGOs, will reshape themselves. The one that I really think is important and that I would like to, there to be far more work on is the trade unions. That's, that seems to me to be the key um, in terms of uh, legitimately holding all external actors to account, as well as advocacy organisations, social justice organisations and so on. Thank you, Gemma. Please. Yeah, um, Mina Toxos from Chatham House. Um, <clears throat> I, I, um, I think no economist could could quibble with this um, uh, pattern that that um, you, uh, Professor Brotigan highlighted of get the infrastructure right, then agriculture, then industry, and then high level services with education and health and so on. Um, I think what's unique about the Chinese uh, model of development is the role of the state and. Um, the fact that it's it's kind of persisted as long as it has, because often many developing economies have started out with a large role of the state, but they've privatized and they've sort of um, become a lot more um, uh, competitive. And um, the question is whether or not, given that China is now at the stage where it can't really sustain that size of state enterprises and continue, they have to start privatizing, and that they need massive reforms in the financial sector, um, given that they're having to grapple with the difficulties of this, whether this is going to change their view of development. Shall we start with uh, Andy Sumner on this one? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's an interesting link here to what something Deborah said about that the, the Chinese don't promote their model overseas, but they don't have to. You just look at the growth rates, look at what's happening. Any government's going to look towards sort of success of a kind. I think when it comes to the role of the state, I mean, one thing the Chinese experience has done is it's made the, it's made the state fashionable again. And whether that's good or bad, and in what sectors that's good or bad, is the kind of debate, I think. Um, I mean, broadening the debate a little bit wider than China, you've, of course, got um, uh, uh, essentially a kind of long-running debate, as you sort of allude to, about the failures of the state, the whole Washington consensus, post-Washington consensus, etc. Uh, and now debates around the Beijing consensus and whether that's state-led. But it's still very fuzzy, I think, exactly where China stands on the state. Because on the one hand, the state can be a director of resources. It can also be a, a drainer of resources you're alluding to in the financial sector. So when you look, to, when you look beyond that, I think uh, there's questions about whether uh, um, just because a country countries, uh, makes the state fashionable again, whether that's necessarily egalitarian in itself, and whether that implies models for other countries, and whether, whether actually when it comes to a, what is effectively a, the original Washington consensus, as Williamson's outlined, you, you, Emerging economies are kind of pick and mix. There's bits and pieces coming from it. The, the financial liberalisation, that kind of stuff's been thrown out the window. But the kind of the original, uh, as Williamson attended, uh, I think uh, actually China sort of picked the bits that it likes as other countries are doing so. So the state has come back in through that route. Deborah. Uh, I would also add that um, as far as privatisation in China, there's been a that emphasis I mentioned earlier about gradualism, but there has been an incredible amount of change there. Um, just if you look at the financial sector, the separation out of the policy banks and then the more commercial banks, if you look at, at the whole industrial sector, there's been a whole private um, enterprise uh, explosion of growth um, and firms that are not state-owned, so really private firms that are run privately. And then there has been privatization of uh, the both the very largest there's been um, an increase in offering shares on stock markets and listing on stock markets so private participation and uh, that element while there still are um, is state the state-owned enterprise sector but then they've been moved out of the ministries under Sussex so they're independent now they're supposed to operate more like corporations not like arms of the state so I think I see a lot of change there in the, the 33 years I've, I've been looking at um, at Chinese development where it's, others might see that the state role continues to be very large it, it is, um, but it's very diff a very different China in terms of the balance between the private sector and the public than it was certainly at the start of the reforms. Michael Lipton, and then back up. Uh, 
I understand that the Chinese are very reluctant to apply any sort of conditionality, and one sees the virtues of that. But I have one problem, and I'd be interested to know how the Chinese react to it. For a project or intervention to succeed, it's necessary that it has the backing and support of the government, especially once the donor has gone. Now, under the Maputo Declaration, just to give an example, uh, a large number of uh, African countries pledged themselves to raise the proportion of government expenditure in agriculture from 5% in 2003 to 10%. Now, the proportion of government investment in agriculture has actually fallen over this time. What does China do to make themselves feel confident that what they are doing in terms of a project or other intervention is actually justified if they're not prepared to apply any sort of conditionality? Well, in, in the agricultural sector, they would, um, they would look for a request. So, uh, for example, they're building now, I think it's up to 25 uh, agro-technology demonstration centers. These are very small, uh, $6 million or so each. Uh, but they've, they're requested by the governments. And so there's a belief, I think they, they sort of think in Beijing that if the government is requesting it formally, that they want it. Now, the reality is, is uh, very different from that. These uh, are sometimes located in, in very unproductive regions. I visited the one in Tanzania, for example, which is way out in the bush. It was a convenient location for the Ministry of Agriculture, but it doesn't have a water source. But the Chinese built it there anyway. So these kinds of problems of sustainability are, are, are rife with this kind of approach. Well, the government told them where to put it. So in that sense, they bought in. They said, we want one of these, and you will put it there, and then you'll build it, and you will go. So rather than the idea you build it, and they will come, <laughs> it's sort of you build it, you go, and then it'll be ours. And I'm, I'm not sure what they're going to use it for, but uh, it's, it's problematic. The, just to add one thing about that, the model for the Chinese of, of the, these stations was that they were supposed to be an experiment where a Chinese company would get um, subsidized by Beijing to build these things and then to operate them for three years. And they were supposed to come up with income generating ideas for how it could become more sustainable and then uh, pass those on to the African side. But that's, that doesn't seem to be working very well. Gentleman right at the back and then the gentleman. Come in. Thanks very much. I'm Alex Shanklin from the Rosing Post International Development Programme at IDS Sussex. Um, I just had a brief comment to compliment what Emma was saying in response to the point about NGOs. I just got back from Brazil working with NGOs there on how they're engaging with Brazil's general cooperation. And one of the things that's very clear is that the split or the quandary they find themselves in, NGOs like Connectors that Emma mentioned, which are more rights-based, have an easier time framing an approach to, to Brazil's responsibilities with regard to human rights. But there's a large contingent of development NGOs within Brazil which are losing all their northern funding and are desperate to get a piece of the South-South cooperation action but at the same time are also desperate to maintain their legitimacy as allies of social movements who are critiquing sub-imperialism from the BRICS. It's a very difficult dilemma they, they find themselves in. Um, uh, and also we need to differentiate between NGOs originating from the Global North such as Oxfam and ActionAid who now have very active offices in the BRICS countries but which are often seen as northern NGOs uh, by other NGOs in those countries. Uh, and we also need to look at the role of civil society organizations from the countries to which China, Brazil, and others are sending development assistance. Uh, so it's quite a complex picture. Uh, the question I had was regard, with regard to um, a curious convergence seems to be taking place between the UK and Brazil. And I was wondering if <laughs> Chief Economist Diffie might have some thoughts about this. Um, in February this year, Secretary of State made a speech stating very clearly that UK aid was going to be encouraged to create opportunities for UK investment in Africa as a way of leveraging jobs and growth. Um, and the UK has traditionally been a very strong defender of aid as unself-interested charity, essentially. Um, similarly, Brazil's historically been a very strong defender of aid as South-South solidarity, in fact, not as aid, as South-South cooperation, also without any commercial linkages. This is differentiated its approach from China historically, except that in May, President Dilma Rousseff made a speech to the African Union announcing that Brazil henceforth will pursue commercial interests as part of its development cooperation strategy. So I was wondering if, uh, if the Chief Economist or other members of the panel want to comment on this curious North-South convergence. Uh, 
That's very, very helpful. Thank you. I'm going to move first to Emma, just to comment, if you, <laughs> you would, maybe on the civil society issues. Sure. I mean, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I think a lot of NGOs now find themselves in a quandary, but then they, they often have. You know, uh, they've, they've always found themselves, I think, torn accountability up, accountability down, and all those sorts of things. Uh, but if you don't mind, I might also, also comment on this question of uh, turning aid to directly, explicitly commercial ends and to supporting the UK economy. And in this, it seems to me, there's one of the big systemic issues that we need to hold in mind is that we're really talking about so many different things. So particularly when we get to China, to Brazil, to India, we use this word aid and it's so misused and, and inappropriately designated. And then, you know, we turn around and make uh, critical comments about sort of rather unethical aid and where is, where's the conditionality, for example. Whereas we don't ask Shell to uh, require conditionality of the Nigerian government. So why would we expect the Brazilian firms who are doing business and who are calling it development cooperation, which gets translated into aid and which gets then criticized for not being very good aid. And I think that this goes back to a very interesting, uh, if you like, conceptual distinction that has emerged in the post-war era and which actually really has its origins in colonial attitudes, which is, uh, and, and it's been strengthened in the last 15 years, which is that uh, there is a difference between big D development intentional interventions to raise standards of living and growth and so on, and, and underlying little d development, the processes of long-term transformation, perhaps associated with capitalism and so on. And I think what we're seeing now, I think much of the Western post-1945 era sort of separated those things out in ways that had a value and, and wasn't always a problem, but often was problematic because then we did development to Africa. And we put ourselves in that sort of separate space. And I think what's happening, what China and Brazil and Saudi Arabia and Qatar are doing is doing little d development in Africa. And those things are not the same. Um, and that then um, has implications. And, and in a way, what we're seeing now is, is simply a kind of a snapping back. The elastic band has snapped back. The last 15 years of, of uh, poverty reduction norms, which David has written about very extensively, I think are collapsing inwards. I mean, they're not going to disappear by any means, but we're seeing a return to the idea of aid as an explicit tool of foreign policy, an explicit tool of commercial um, uh, leverage. And of course, I think many of the sort of traditional powers, Australia, Canada, the Dutch, the British, are delighted that this is the case, it, you know, and they can turn around and say, well, the Brazilians and the Chinese are doing it terribly successfully, so we ought to do the same. And of course, there is lots of opportunity, lots of possibility from infrastructure and growth and so on, if, if, if it is harnessed to an inclusive uh, development agenda rather than a growth agenda. And in our own country, we know that's a problem. So why do we expect that a growth agenda is going to translate automatically into a development agenda, whether it's being done by the Commonwealth Development Corporation, not a great record, or whether it's being done by Sinopec? You know, it's, it's contingent, it's context-based, it's different, but this collapse of the, develop, the, two, the big D development and the little D development into each other raise all sorts of threats and challenges um, and, and opportunities and possibilities. Stefan, did you want to respond? Um, I think I should. I think you should, <laughs> absolutely. Um, but but, but with Emma's intervention, uh, I think it's another layer of, of question emerged as well. Um, so, and I'm just briefly thinking of making sure I, I, I cover both points, um, but, but very simply, because you made at the end here a point as well in terms of, um, in terms of you know, the growth that may be created and, and how it leads into poverty reduction, which is quite a different thing of the more specific point of using aid tied to, um, to, to commercial interest in a very direct way. And so I just want to comment on both of them because both of them may be controversial um, and I want to try, try to be clear about it. Um, I mean, let me first try to, well, I, I would be sure, probably assure you, uh, however much I would like at a conference like this say that we've learned from Brazil, um, I think it's quite unrelated. Um, I think where we are is, um, is trying to ensure there is a better articulation of why aid is actually beneficial. And, you know, um, Prime Minister 
has been making speeches and repeatedly said so. I think our Secretary of State, even at the Tory party conference, uh, repeated it, you know, thinking of aid as a good thing from a moral point of view, but also that it's in the national interest. The idea that commercial interest of the UK comes into it is actually just a, a, a simple continuation from that national interest. But I should be very clear, there is absolutely no talk ever internally or externally about the repealing of the International Development Act that very clearly says that uh, aid is untied. There is absolutely not a single instrument that we're trying to design that says, you know, and how can we here get UK firms, little commercial interests, and behave now in these countries and we just give them small trade loans or whatever it is. There is no difference in not setting up a policy bank, if that's what you're asking. Um, the, so we're not doing that. Um, but what we are doing is, is uh, and I think Secretary of State has talked quite a bit about it, is putting thinking about economic development and growth as an agenda also for Africa much more at center stage. And I, that means, and you'll need to comment later on what Emma says, but in the first point is he's simply saying, the argument is, is very simply, a growing and prosperous Africa is good for the UK. It will be good for security, it will be good for any agenda you want to name, uh, whether, whether um, and I want to be careful now, whether truly or imaginary having big impacts going from global health to migration to, to any kind of things. It's just a good thing to have growth in a prosperous Africa uh, there. And um, so, so that's clearly a name. And the commercial interest arises is that it's of course clear that trade opportunities arise when countries are growing. Trade opportunities don't arise simply in zero sum games. So you just want to actually try to achieve that. And I think that's very strongly at the center now in strategies in DFID. Uh, Secretary of State actually, in a sense, in a Tory party conference, announced it again or repeated it again. In fact, at the moment, we move into doing arguably a bit more on that area. I don't think it's kind of suddenly 90% of our resources go there and not. It's nothing to do with that, but saying, you know, look, put that more centrally in terms of doing. I think that's where it is, to saying, you know, part of a narrative, that is good for us. Africa is growing, not everywhere it's growing fast enough. Let, let's do this. How do we think about relationship with poverty? And I do feel like I want to answer that. Um, is that in all the talk we're doing, including when we're talking about dealing with private sector firms, we're putting jobs and incomes first. The narrative is very much, we, we are not about just creating growth, but we want to have good quality growth. And the fundamental objective there is to focus on jobs and incomes. And it gets sometimes a bit lost on all parts of the debate, it gets a bit lost. But there are certain things also that are a bit difficult to deny, is that you know not a single country has ever reduced poverty significantly without actually growing. And then, of course, it does it better when it actually creates jobs and creates, uh, creates incomes and doing so. And so we want to keep on putting in place, you know, especially when we work with private sector, that it's about job creation, certain things. CDC was mentioned. Oh, uh, I will end up defending them as well. Um, just briefly in terms of saying, you know, it's the same logic. Uh, they are now in a position where they will be judged in their performance on the basis of a grid that combines how difficult the countries are to work in and how good for job creation the investments are that they do. So put it differently, in due course it will be bonuses will be linked. Uh, for, this is for a fund manager quite interesting, quite original. Bonuses will be linked in, to job creation and, 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 and working in very difficult places. I hope I'm not announcing something here too early, but I think that's true. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Well, everyone's taking a note. Deborah. Any press in the room? Uh, I just want to point out, again, a, a difference between um, China, and I think this is probably also true of Japan, and maybe Korea, but the, the instruments that they have, the very large ones for engaging and supporting their um, engagement in a place like Africa, the very large ones are not the official development assistance instruments. So if you were to, to look at uh, the Chinese amounts of money that are available and the United States, for example, um, in the United States, we have a paltry amount of export credits that go off to Africa. We have a little bit of OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. We have tiny mute, uh, bits of equity funds that we put in and, uh, and commercial loans that have anything to do with the government. And then we have aid, official development assistance, which is $10 billion now annually. And these other things are in the millions usually. For the Chinese, it's the opposite. So their their other their equity funds and their risk insurance and their uh, export credits are big, 
and then their official development assistance is small. So that's what we're, that's the picture we're dealing with. And yet we have this idée fixe that, that our engagement with Africa should be about aid. And so the Chinese are doing aid there because uh, all these other things must be aid because it's Africa. Thank you. Look, Emma mentioned David's work. I've always been an avid reader uh, on poverty. So I just wanted David to say a couple of words. Okay, well, just, I mean, yeah, a very few words. But a lot of what we're talking about is whether the, um, the emerging powers I mean, are, are, are good or bad. This morning that was about whether geopolitical stability was threatened or whether uh, geopolitical relations would allow us to be optimistic about the future. But I think uh, when you look at the, the poverty record and particularly the human development record, then over the last 15 years, while the emerging powers have been emerging, this has obviously been a whole set of processes associated with globalization, associated with the collapse of the, um, of the Iron Curtain and a set of things. But the human development record, um, which was good, has actually upturned. You know, incomes have risen, income poverty is reduced, longevity has gone up, uh, infant and child mortality rates have gone down. I mean, that's not been uniform. There are complicated patterns spread around the world. There's at least a billion people who haven't benefited, but certainly the background data about these last 15 years when we've moved into this w world of, uh, of emerging powers uh, it suggests that there is some dynamic which in aggregate terms is certainly progressing human development at, at, at the micro level um, and that. Once you try and tease that out, it gets incredibly complicated, but there is, I mean, cause for a, a degree of optimism that thinks something is going right. David, thank you. Gentleman there, then gentleman there. And my comment really relates to the significance of this um, mutual benefit win-win discourse, both for the Chinese and also obviously for the UK in, in relation to um, Africa, of course. Um, and I was very struck by uh, the example that um, Deborah gave um, with the, the DRC. I mean, the question really is the project there, you know, whose mutual benefit um, was was involved there. It was obviously, from what you were saying, the, the Chinese railway company on the one side, and, well, you didn't say, but one might infer that it was the, the ruling elite in the DLC. So really the question is about unpackaging when we talk about mutual benefits. Who are we talking about in, the, in this? And it's, it's too easy to fall into the, the kind of national state centre, well, not state centre, but the, the national centre. Thank you. Deborah. Uh, I think that's, that's an interesting um, assumption. I think if you look at the infrastructure packages that uh, have gone along with the, the few of these loans that do exist, it's largely, um, it's infrastructure, it's, it's supposed to finance infrastructure that's broad-based roads, electricity, um, health clinics, hospitals, schools, universities, that's in many ways you could look at that as social infrastructure as well as regular economic infrastructure. And I would, I would say that this does benefit anytime you have public works programs, as we all know in our countries, our democracies, uh, this is the kind of pork that politicians love. So it's definitely a benefit to the political elites to be able to finance these kinds of visible projects. But I would also think that for the people, and I've heard from people in the Congo who say we can now get from A to B in a fraction of the time that it used to take because of the new road that was financed uh, through this this package, and you hear the same thing in Angola about the lights now being on and so on. So there are definite um, benefits for people, real people, from infrastructure investments that are financed this way. And I think in, in the DRC, we haven't yet seen uh, the full um, power of the model because it's been so problematic, and the Exim Bank has suspended funding at various times, so the infrastructure is not um, kicked in to the extent that it will once, and the mine is not on, on track either. So that's all, it's, it's problematic. But um, I think if we keep looking at this, it's going, we're going to see that it's going to have an impact that people will appreciate, not just the elites. Stefan, 30 uh, seconds. So, I mean, talking, yes, uh, given my record here, the win-wins <laughs> the, the, the with China, I think it's, it's really important, you know, the win-win will come about 
when we can move beyond uh, just having the natural resource as the kind of central thing where it's all around. You know, once, once we get Chinese investment and Asian investment at more scale in kind of other sectors, which we get in some countries already, I think that's where I would say that's the potential where the win-win is, is, is much better. On the other side of it, of course, the way, where, where we need to keep on working with, and that, for example, is including with African governments, and actually quite a lot of donors are trying to do quite imaginative work with African governments of trying to strengthen institutional environments and institutional ways of working and, and getting their contracting envi environments better sorted out. And I think that's where the gains would be. We can help African governments to be stronger in that on the natural resources. But I think the dynamics, you know, for me, why I'm, why I'm actually optimistic is I do think that kind of switch more and more to, to manufacturing and other kinds of industries it's that's where the real the real gains will come for Africa and I I uh, well I'm optimistic on that gentleman over there I don't know. I'm hopeful. Yeah. I was uh, very interested with the uh, example that Erba gave about the uh, agricultural station which was uh, uh, done in the wrong place uh, this is I guess the, the very small D huh, which is very important for a lot of people but it's uh, you know, very small in the whole uh, aid budget perhaps um, that happens in Turkey as well. Turkey has uh, the examples like that. I guess that is one of the uh, results of not having a locally based uh, development uh, experts. DFIT has, I don't know how many people working all over in the world, but I don't think China has a, probably any. Uh, maybe very few. Turkey is establishing a few. But I think a local presence is very important, this type of, uh, this type of activity. Uh, for instance, I, I think China, well, one of the ways of getting away with that is to cooperate, to do some uh, joint work with UNDP, for instance. And uh, as far as I know, China is rather uh, reluctant to do that. I think there's a very small thing with, in Cambodia where they have a, a Kasawa development uh, where the uh, UNDP is saying, well, this is the right thing to do. Not somebody's pet project, because the pet projects come uh, up like that. Some local person says, OK, talks with the Chinese or Turkish or whatever, says, do this here, and then they do it, but that's the wrong place. So I think that uh, organizational issue is fairly important. The second thing is, again, about China. And China had a big problem with uh, buying land in Brazil. Uh, they, Brazil, if I'm not mistaken, that they were buying, and then this whole issue of land grab type of uh, buying land uh, as the agriculture investment was not very much liked by the Brazilians, if I'm not mistaken. Huh? But they, that is being fairly freely done in Africa. So that type of thing is also depends on where you're acting and whether you're doing something in Brazil or whether you're doing something I don't know, in, the, in some African countries. One third thing, if I may, it's about the NGOs. Uh, in Turkey, we have a very small NGO, which I'm a founder actually with some friends, which does development work in Africa. There are other uh, NGOs which are faith-based, shall we say, but they're also doing development. But I mean, they, they are much more uh, like in, uh, in Qatar and Saudi Arabia. They are very active, but they're less of the type like ours, which is doing some development work, which, has totally, which is totally purely <coughs> developmental. And uh, I can give some examples if uh, somebody wants what we do, but it's, it's a good thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I'm not sure there was a question. So, Deborah, do you want to? I just want to say one thing about the Chinese ag agricultural engagement in Africa. I'm doing a new book on this, and what I'm, I've found, and I think anyone that, that's seen my work on this has, has seen this, that there's very little. And so, whereas they may be experiencing problems in Brazil, they're also experiencing a lot of problems in Africa. And there's actually a lot, a lot less even interest in uh, large-scale investment in Africa than you would think. And the few examples that we have where there, there has been interest have not been borne out, um, even cases of Chinese getting leases and then going back to China and never appearing again. So it's, a, it's more of a mystery, like what happened to the Chinese interest in land in Africa that we all thought was so huge? It's not uh, appearing, at least not yet. Lady there, then gentleman here. Thank you. Lady in the blue, please. Uh, thank you. I, I want to uh, return to this uh, um, issue that uh, Deborah uh, mentioned about the fact that Chinese uh, do not uh, uh, demand uh, uh, sort of conditionality for the, do not link their uh, development aid to the fact that countries should become like like China. But I wonder whether that, even if they do not do that 
uh, explicitly, where implicitly they do, in fact, influence uh, the way that the political systems in those countries are developing. Because uh, you mentioned modernization theory. I mean, if we look at the sort of classic modernization theory, um, the idea is, of course, that economic development, rise of prosperity should lead to the rise of middle class, and middle class should bring the values of democracy, rule of law, accountability with them. Uh, and uh, we have seen now, really, in, in the last decade, uh, a number of countries who went through development with new middle class emerging, but with a kind of values that do not necessarily lead towards you know, a more sort of democratic trajectory of, the, uh, of their political uh, system. Um, and while you know, Western development uh, uh, agencies you know, have been um, sort of more reluctant now to promote democracy as a part of their kind of development assistance, I think we've seen a quite a big pushback from uh, new players uh, who explicitly want to encourage uh, you know, new middle classes to support more of a statist approach, you know, less support for democratic institutions, civil society, etc. So I wonder whether you agree with that, and if that is the case, you know, how can we encourage uh, more democratic countries like India or Brazil or even South Africa, you know, to play more active role? Thank you very much. I'm going to Deborah and then Andy on this one. Uh, I don't, as I said earlier, and as I think you've repeated, there isn't any, uh, I have seen no effort to make um, any of the engagement conditional on acceptance of, of a Chinese model. Um, and I actually think that the Chinese really don't care what kind of country they're dealing with as long as they can do business. Uh, for example, their, their largest investor, uh, the, the country they invest in most in Africa is South Africa, which is the most vibrant democracy on the continent. So they have, a, um, and uh, the, one of the, their, the places where they would most like to invest their, for natural resources, where the Chinese companies are all heading, it's not the Democratic Republic of the Congo or, or Nigeria or Angola, it's Australia. And they're very interested in Canada too. So. <laughs> Uh, they like stable places where they can do business, where there's a rule of law, where their investments can be protected. So I, I do think that to, all those things make sense for their engagement, and um, I think that, that the fact that they go to those places, they would like to invest more in the United States and, and as well, that that bears, uh, that's, that's favorable for the kind of uh, outcomes in terms of uh, at least benefiting uh, countries that are already democratic and not uh, encouraging them to become non-democratic. Uh, but I think also the, the more the economies build up and the middle class builds up in some places, we can see it hasn't worked so well in Russia. And certainly in China, there's no recognition yet that China is going to follow the mode of Korea and Taiwan and have a democratic transition when they get to, what is it, 6,000 per capita income in $1990, <laughs> according to uh, some of the research. but. Um, the jury's still out on that. It could be a Singapore, it could be a, a Taiwan. It could go either way. As Suman will know, the Chinese have just invested hugely in the North Sea. Um, but, Andy? Um, yeah, I was just picking up on this issue about middle classes in emerging economies. Um, I think the one thing about what, what gets labelled as the new middle classes is, is, is they're not very middle class in the way that we would think of at least being secure from poverty. So you're talking about people who look at the data that between say two and ten dollars a day the studies from Latin America tend to link the the uh, um, the chance of falling back into poverty at around something like seven to ten dollars a day uh, depending on the country you look at so you're, you're basically talking about people who are barely out of poverty themselves and because we get fooled by very low poverty lines you know no criticism of, of I mean I've been there myself in terms of, of, of <laughs> government policy I've, I've, I've worked I spent time with David. Well, that's Stefan. Uh, uh, I think I think I mean I'm curious what you think about this because basically we, we kind of you assume that you know you move someone from say a dollar twenty to about two or three dollars job done no longer our problem internationally so are we going to end up with a world where basically the bulk of the world's population won't be in extreme poverty, but they'll be vulnerable to poverty on a, you know, one, one illness away from poverty or, or one economic shock? But at the same time, I think there's an issue that this burgeoning group of people who are neither poor on a day-to-day -day basis nor, nor secure from poverty, they, it, we were doing work with the, with the World Value Survey, and the preferences for redistribution grow very quickly in countries where that group is burgeoning. But at the same time, so you look at the World Value Survey, 
They don't trust their own governments to do it because they see their own governments corrupt. So you end up with this massive contradiction of a large growing group of people so in between poverty and, and security who, who want something but don't see their governments can do it. And I guess that's part of the story where you think, see things spilling out in, in, in Brazil, Turkey. You know, they, they talk about uh, once you come out of poverty, uh, you obviously start paying indirect taxes. You know, you have a you know, relationship with the state starts to change because you start paying money to the state. Um, and so I wonder whether... Uh, some of the, I was thinking a minute ago whether we should, there's a kind of a step back a bit from the, the kind of excitement about emerging economies. You're still talking about the bulk of the world's extreme poor in emerging economies. Yes, two thirds of the world's developing countries are converging with OECD average incomes, but that's from an incredibly low base. I mean, it's, uh, there may be three or four countries that are high income in 10 years time, 15 years time, but they'll only be Brazil, Indonesia, China, those kind of countries. So I wonder whether there's a, a sort of stepping back a bit and when you talk about development models, so the session here about development models were the, the title of the session, I was thinking, well, yes, there's a lot of growth. Yes, absolute poverty or extreme poverty, whatever you measure, is reducing. But actually, you're just moving into this position where there's a large number of very vulnerable position people. And that's just much more around social policy, social protection, insurance risks, which I'm sure Stefan is on very strong territory, given his academic history. Uh, so I think we just need to be a little bit careful about the kind of excitement around emerging economies and just sort of take a step back. They're still pretty poor countries. And take, for example, somewhere like Ghana, Senegal, Sudan. These are all middle-income countries that are going through drastic changes, even structurally. It's not always commodity-driven, because that's the other issue. Is this structural change driven? Is, you know, is it non-agriculture or is it, is it commodity-driven? Um, the moment you get outside of some of the big urban centres, you're back in a low-income country. You know, two hours' drive from Accra, Ghana isn't a booming third world country, a booming middle income country. I'll stop there. I cannot, I know there's a lot of people, but I cannot go forward without allowing Stefan just to say a minute or so on that. Well, I don't know, maybe one day uh, Tim Harford could do a, a program on your numbers, but that's another matter. Uh, <laughs> there's a bit of issues there with, with statistics. But the, the, the very simple, two simple points is that first of all, you know, why do we draw that line so low, even if these people above there are still quite a lot of vulnerable people? Actually, it has a very simple, very simple moral argument. We draw the, the line low and we focus with our efforts there because that's a way of guaranteeing that we focus on the poorest people in the poorest places. If we make the line much higher, then our catchment group is fine and a middle class guy, um, a middle class guy in uh, Peru who may not be as middle class as I, as I am, but he, he would then still get support while a very, very poor person in Ethiopia wouldn't do. So you draw that line so low because you first want to tackle that. I bet in 10 years we'll have another poverty line where we will spend our 0.7 of uh, GNI. And that would be great if we got rid of that first group and we could focus on the next one. And the second thing is on that moving of the emerging powers. And that's actually getting there. So this kind of very strange thing, country like India, where you actually get this strange process of actually, you know, actually three quarters of the world extreme poor live in middle, uh, middle income countries. And it will be like this. And well, in, well, probably by 2030 it will be. But actually, in a very funny sort of way, because that's where I, I think you have to be careful with the way you, you put it. These three quarters, quite a lot of these three quarters of, of people living in middle income countries are in countries where the trajectories of poverty are actually pretty good. India has gone actually on quite an interesting trajectory. You can't co compare the Indian trajectory to the trajectory or the Chinese trajectory, for example, with almost, what is it, still close to 100 million. That compared to, say, a trajectory that we see in DRC or in Ethiopia. Actually, Ethiopia is not a good example. DRC or Tanzania, where it's not going as fast. So you want to look where they're going. And so there's a lot of poor people in emerging powers, but actually they're actually powering ahead. They're slowly but steadily powering out. Now, then you get a strange final thing. I'm sorry, this final thing. It will be there. There will be lots of poor people in middle-income countries in 2030, probably a similar percentage as now. But that's to do with because a lot of new countries will enter middle income status, while actually the poverty in the middle income status will keep on going down. It's simply that they inherit the stock of poverty by the time they hit that kind of useless cutoff point, middle income, and they still have a lot of poverty. What you want to look at is where they're going, not where they're, where, where they're now. And quite a lot of countries are on a downward trajectory. And I think it's quite legitimate, say, to give less attention to the countries that are on a downward trajectory than the countries that actually were stuck with very high poverty for a while. Thank Probably better we continue this conversation. <laughs> this conversation is going to go on for days, so I'm going to move to this gentleman here.
want you. <laughs> and then the lady there, and then the lady uh, over there. And then the I just there. wanted to uh, ask, maybe <laughs> Emma or uh, David, any one of them can take it up, that when you look at globalization in relation to development, particularly in relation to third world countries, I think globalization has not come as an angel, uh, maybe angel of a middle class or the upper, but the lower rung of the people, it has come as a devil. Huge death rate, huge poverty, and increase of uh, income levels, um, gaps between the poor and the rich. Uh, I can say in India that it is massive. Now, in this context, uh, how did you know, countries like India, Bangladesh, and South Africa take globalization? And then, uh, how are they negotiating? One, uh, uh, something I read about Bangladesh is that that seems to be doing uh, comparatively much better in terms of growth rate and so on. Uh, you know, how, how, do, how does it work in terms of uh, the packages that come, in terms of the classes that it build? The middle class that someone was talking is not a positive middle class that has emerged out of this. It is a very, very negative middle class towards the human being down below. That's very helpful. I'm going to go to David and then to Emma. Okay. Um, I work on Bangladesh, so That's hearing Bangladesh asked. mentioned is really delightful because Bangladesh is a hidden success story. Many problems, highly imperfect, but most people don't realize the progress that Bangladesh has made with 6%, 5 to 6% growth for the last five, uh, 15 years and the human development indicators going up. Looks as though it's going to achieve most of the millennium development goals, which is unusual for low-income um, <laughs> country. If one looks at that contrast, which Amartya Sen's been pointing at in, in his recent works, then um, certainly one has to note that the growth in Bangladesh does appear to have been somehow more generating of the jobs and the incomes towards the bottom end of the scale um, than it has been in, in India, where obviously you've got different uh, types of, uh, of industries, and particularly the ready-made garments industry and that. Um, there are disputes about this because clearly the women who work in the ready-made garments industry are on very low wages, are often exploited in a number of ways and are treated very badly. But certainly within um, Bangladeshi society, they're seen as having moved up significantly in terms of income and status. If you have one daughter in a factory, then you're doing well and you're probably making a household strategy for how you'll invest. If you have two daughters, then you're probably thinking about whether you can pay a tout and get somebody to Kuwait or somebody to Malaya to really increase your income. So there's a whole set of those processes. The remittances also have helped to fuel what's happened in, in, in Bangladesh. It's export of labor and the fact that that labor sends its money back um, to a very high, um, high degree. The really interesting thing academically for Bangladesh is the paradox that it is. It is incredibly badly governed. The <laughs> leaders and the political part, the leaders are venal. Trust me, I've met them. Um, <laughs> the, the, the political parties are absolutely co corrupted and so at the moment I suppose the big question that one's looking at is whether these processes of growth and human development and, uh, and and women's empowerment whether they've changed institutions in a way which means that one can look for the the next set of industries or opportunities and improve the institutions further or whether it's just been a fortunate sort of conjuncture and the right package of investment came together with cheap labor at the right time but whether we're not in a dynamic process of growth and human development. No answer on that for sure yet. Emma, thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, it's uh, such a big question. I, I know a little more about India than uh, most other places, so I can talk perhaps a bit about that. I mean, if, if you look internally at India, of course, a magnificent economy in many ways, social change, all sorts of possibilities, declining uh, poverty, although perhaps not quite as fast as we're told. Um, but there is a violence to that process. Uh, if we look at internal uh, land grabbing, if you like, the uh, ways in which um, uh, Adivasis, the indigenous people, small farmers, uh, marginalized people of all varieties, slum dwellers have been uh, violently alienated from their land, their property, um, in the pursuit 
of cleaner, greener Delhi or bauxite or whatever. Um, and of course, historically, development has been a very ugly process. It isn't a nice process, by and large. We've, we've kind of made it nice, and we tend to think of it as nice, but it's historically actually not been. Um, of course, there's no re that doesn't mean there is a reason it should be violent and alienating. But my question is, I suppose, is, is what sort of... Um, stepping back from this question of the emerging powers becoming more active and just simply actually more visible development partners and actors, if we go back to the modernization theory, or the modernization theory era, the high point of it, uh, that was in the context of developmental states and, and state-led economies, which for all their faults tended to be a period of global growth between the 1950s and 70s. Um, where we are now, where we see a sort of second resurgence, if you like, of modernization theory, is in a period of neoliberal globalization. So a neoliberal globalization has a very uneven record on growth, but it has an almost universal record on inequality. Everywhere has become more unequal. And I'm very persuaded by, the, I mean, of course global poverty is a huge, huge issue. It's, it's the biggest issue, but very close behind it is, is equality. Um, and in terms of uh, social unrest, I don't think getting people to two or three dollars a day, I'm going to agree, I think, with you, Andy, it, I think it's going to cause more problems than less in some ways. Because you may get the bulk of the population to two and a half dollars a day, but when you're walking through, you know, Mumbai, watching people spending, you know, that on a coffee, that's, that's when the anger rises, I think. So this, this question of uh, what's, first of all, the, the global context within which the emerging powers are becoming more active players is, is a very different one. And, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, we, it, and it inflects back within, whether we're talking about zero hour contracts in Britain or whether we're talking about the IMF in Greece. These questions are, are, are they enable us to go far beyond these problematic geographic distributions of doing development out there. And, and I think that's one of the, again, this kind of collapsing this idea of development, big D, we do it over there, and development, small d, this is the world we live in, is really important. And bringing that to bear, not just on China and India, but also on ourselves, I think is critical. Um, I would like to think the emerging powers will help lead a more, inclus a more inclusive uh, growth than has been achieved under, say, the last 20, 30 years of neoliberalism. I don't think they will. And while I think the win-win discussion and debate is, is uh, very impressive. This seems to me to be um, anchored around the idea of greater justice between states. And hooray for that, a more plural world order, and so on. And it's not inflecting sufficiently into the idea of greater justice within states, whether India or Senegal. I'm gonna be really brave. I'm going to get through three more questions. This lady, this lady, and this lady. And then we'll take it from there, please. So can I plead for clarity and brevity? Uh, uh, thank you. I want to come back to the first thing Deborah said, which was that China felt it didn't develop because of aid, uh, and this influenced its views. Well, no country has developed because of aid. But the question is, what does China think it can offer to developing countries? Or does it not think it can offer anything except maybe sympathy and a much more long-term view? Because if you take the, the structural view that you say China is taking, then you're taking a much longer-term view than trying to reach the MDGs by, uh, what, by next year. You're talking about something that's over 50 years. Is this the way China is looking at it? And, but more specifically, what does it think that it is giving to countries? A few trips to China to see how things ought to be done. Uh, and this ties in a little bit to some of the things that Stefan said. I think it's highly worrying to concentrate only on the $1 to $2 a day, because then you cut off aid to India once it gets above anything like that. It's not clear to me that this is the basis for a long-term view of development. And if China has anything to offer, it is that, China, that development isn't a one-year project. Thank you very much, Deborah. I think that um, China thinks, China thinks. Uh, <laughs> hey, Chinese. <laughs> um, let me put it a different way. Um, 
When China came out of the Maoist period, they knew they needed engagement uh, with the rest of the world. And so they set up what they called the open door system. They had that relationship with Japan. And soon they joined the World Bank in 1980. And so they, they realized that reaching out to the rest of the world would be important for a number of things. And that would be for finance, to get finance with, that they didn't yet have out of their own savings, to get investment to come in, to boost their trade so they could import capital goods and pay for them, and to get ideas. And so they sent people out to be educated. And uh, I, so I think that their view of what they can offer to developing countries is quite similar to that, that they can offer trade so that countries can get more uh, benefit from their products uh, and the prices have gone up. But they don't say you should use that benefit and do this or that with it. They offer um, finance. They offer um, ideas. And they offer university scholarships. In Africa now, it's uh, 6,600 per year. Um, and so I think that it's quite similar to the way they looked at things as they were emerging from the Maoist period. Hey, over there. Hi, Namukali Chintu from the University of Cambridge Judge Business School. Um, I, my question is really around Af the African growth story and emerging markets in general and private sector development. Deborah mentioned that there's two types of China in Africa in general. One is the state-led, but the other is a lot of private firms that are doing um, a lot of investment. Second thing that she mentioned was the ratio of ODA to aid in the West is about 80-20, whereas in China it's the other way around. And then Stefan talked about um, you know, incentives for impact investing, and at the same time mentioned that there is no policy bank for this. So my question really is, um, you know, for Western countries, FDI into Africa has either stagnated or declined. And um, is, is a policy bank, you know, one of, you know, is a policy bank or some of the interventions China is using one way to engage, if indeed you think that Africa and, and the growth in Africa is a good thing? obviously given the situation of government shutdowns and the recession, I mean, is it something that's worth considering, policy bank? Stefan. Mm. Um, well, okay, so, so we have to be a little bit careful, I think, with FDI figures to Africa, because depending on which year you look at, it's gone down or it's gone up. It's actually, the trend has actually been, been going up and it has not really been dramatically dented. Uh, with the financial crisis. So I would actually still say there's a certain positive story, although I know there's been uh, one recent year that it went down quite remarkably. Um, so should we engage? It's actually a, a really interesting question and, you know, I actually, I'll, I'll be very honest, I never thought, but I probably will from now on uh, also use the language of a policy bank and, and, and the idea, because, you know, there's a potentially a, a, an idea around it. There's been a lot of countries have ultimately development banks in their own in their own way. We have, of course, lots of multinational institutions that are, uh, uh, in that sense, development banks and maybe policy banks. Uh, so, should we do more of that? Well, it's it's an interesting thing. The key thing here you want to think about is actually capital the scarce good here. And where I'm actually not entirely convinced is that in a lot of countries, for the kind of impact investment that will create jobs and incomes is that actually it's capital at a kind of massive scale is a scarce factor. Put it differently, I'll come back to what I mentioned earlier, institutional environment, getting contracting environment sorted, getting these progress in these areas, political economy areas, rent-seeking behavior areas, and so on, we'll probably need to do far more. But yes, there are definitely, and there is, I think, you know, for me it is also, and I'll probably share that with you, there, it's a time to, to start looking at Africa for much more investment. And ultimately, I mean, this is why I'm actually, personally also, I'm quite positive about uh, China in Africa and also quite a lot of other countries emerging powers in Africa because, you know, there's nothing worse for Africa uh, um, than, than no investment. You know, it's, it's you know, better to have all this kind of investment with all the problems. And I think there's, there's been just such a long time, nobody saw opportunities there. And I think it's creating a new language, a new dialogue, a new thinking, how can we get this? Is it a policy bank? So it depends on the analysis, is that scarce good? But uh, we, we could do it. You could probably think of CDC as a, is actually very similar to what's called uh, the, the fund? The fund China that, Africa Development Fund. The China fund. Africa Development Fund, ultimate an equity fund, and, and does very similar things. So we have something in common already. Please, let me go. Thank you. Um, Sarah Parkin. Um, 
from Forum for the Future, which is a sustainable development not-for-profit. It's a question to more than one on the panel. How do you think the anticipated huge population rises in countries like China, Africa, and India will have on the trajectory of these emerging powers? Do you think it'll be beneficial? Do you think it'll undermine it? Or do you think it'll be a neutral factor? Um. Um. I was going to mention the middle classes again. If, assuming, for, assuming that inequality is static or falls, uh, and then extreme poverty is reduced to very low levels, then most of this population growth in a lot of countries is going to be in that, in, not day-to-day -day poor and not day-to-day -day secure, it's going to be in that sort of area. And if there are major political implications of, or it related to inequality that Emma mentioned, uh, I think there's, there's potential for some political turmoil around that. What it means for sustainability is the, is the kind of it's always the elephant in the room, isn't it? You know, the world, you can't imagine the world all consuming at Western type levels. Mm. And yet no one politically is able to have that conversation with Western publics that, you know, maybe you can't eat meat every day because of the, the, the carbon footprint. Um, and so I, I don't know where to go with that, but it's, it's a, a conversation with North, you know, Northern publics about how they choose to consume. I, I, I can't let this stuff out in the past, because I, I think you were, you were going the wrong way, I thought. Uh, because I think the, the, what we should think of, you know, we have to be very careful with population growth. Uh, just, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a red herring, and we have to just think, we, we, we're pretty sure of where it's going. We know when it roughly will be peaking. Demography is actually quite on top of it, because the structure's all been laid about it. The real story is about structures. It's about the population structures. The population structures will changing, and we're going to get very important things. A lot of these emerging economies, and including a bit slower than in Africa, it will start happening. This moment of potential demographic dividends, you know, a lot of people of working age looking after relatively few people that are very old and very young, uh, which is a real opportunity, but also a real risk when lots of jobs have to be created. And I think the, the story on demography is a story about demographic dividend. I'm pretty confident on that, given all uh, the shaking of the heads. The, 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 I guess, I, guess the, I have to just say, uh, abusing the chair wildly, and Deborah, I will come to you, that I fundamentally disagree with what Stefan has just said. Oh. Uh, but, <laughs> but, we, but unfortunately, or fortunate for the rest of the audience, um, you asked that question towards the end. So I'll just <laughs> register that. Please, Deborah. Darren, I wanted to hear you. I want to hear more. Why do you disagree? I simply dis I disagree for three reasons. One, I don't think that we know what population is going to do in any circumstance whatsoever. If you read some of John Cleland's recent uh, Writes, writings, they're absolutely clear that the numbers could go in any direction in all parts of the world, not just Africa. Second point, we simply haven't addressed many of the issues that come from that. It's all right to give us demographic dividend. Oh, fabulous. But there will still be, in many parts of the world, for a long period of time, 50% of the population under the age of 16. Look at Mexico. Mexico has to educate an extra million people a year for the next 20 years. That's a huge infrastructure challenge. And if you don't do that, then where does the employment come from? And the third issue is where does the employment come from in those kind of issues in a global society where expectations are high? That's what I said, not a risk. No, 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 no. Security or a risk of the structure? That's what I said. The last thing I definitely said here. Okay, well, we'll agree. Deborah. I just wanted to point out that with regard to China, it's not a question uh, where the risk is um, of huge population growth. The Chinese have, for better or for worse, had very draconian uh, population <laughs> policies in place for a long time. And their issue more is now that uh, with the one-child policy, their demographic dividend is coming to an end. And so they are uh, getting to a point where their labor costs are increasing. And so that's a very different uh, situation. I've got time for one more question, sir. <laughs> uh, David Shipley of Drayton Finch. Um, as I think Dr. Morsley indicated a couple of times, there's also a strong emphasis on investing in infrastructure in the developing world from the Arab and Gulf states particularly. Um, I'd be interested to hear, uh, sorry, from the Gulf states particularly. Um, I'd be interested to hear how the panel think that differs from the Chinese model and the more traditional Western model. Anna, would you like to comment on the Gulf states? 
and how that differs from China? Uh, I can't, um, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> I, I, would, I would like to be able to do that. But I do think the Gulf states, I will say this, are uh, surprisingly under-researched in these sorts of forums. And I think this is one of the problems, of course, with the BRICS that I'm sure everyone in this room would agree with this artificial name that's become something, is that apart from anything else, I think it's turned our attention away from uh, not just the second tier, but this other kind of world of very major investors, very important uh, states uh, in, in Africa and elsewhere. So I'm afraid I don't know enough. David. A, a quick point on that. I mean, I have to agree, it's incredibly under-researched. A little bit of work I've done with, with Gulf um, donors and that, though, does show that, I mean, accountability and reporting and monitoring is just from another planet. And certainly people will explain that sometimes in terms of Islam. But I mean, you give the money to an intermediary who is taking on then the moral duty, but you've had your duty, then you trust them to use it but you don't really expect them to report back to you. And I know some work that we've done on trying to establish a sufficiency line for Saudi Arabia. People want to telex us into a private bank accounts, large sums of money. They seem to be operating in a quite different world than the world of aid effective and traditional donors. And the final point I'd put on, partly relates to Bangladesh, but many other Islamic countries, there have been tens of thousands of Wahhabi-ist uh, madrasas spread around the world through money from Saudi Arabia. Um, one can be alarmist about those, but really we don't know very much about those, whether they have engineered uh, the sorts of social changes uh, and theological changes they want or not. But that's certainly something that uh, yeah, we shall find out about in the future. Andy. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to very briefly to obviously obligatory to say very briefly at this stage. Um, um, just, uh, I think Emma made a really important point, actually relates to the entire day's conference, what do we actually mean by emerging economies, emerging powers. You take a very broad definition, like convergence with OECD per capita income, you end up with about 70 countries. But then when you narrow that down and down and down and down, and you end up with you know, it's, you know, which countries have actually gone through long run structural change, where their characteristics start to look a bit like rich countries, not poor countries, traditional characteristics, then you're down to about 10, 12 countries. It, it narrows down very quickly. And I think it relates to this, that typically emerging economies are defined as by acronyms. And so there's, I mean, because emerging economies evolved, I think out of, out of a lot of business studies, a lot of financial sector, you've, got, you've always got the BRICS, N11, blah, 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 blah. But actually, you, you want not only a convergence of per capita income, you want some kind of convergence of structural characteristics so that countries start to look a bit more like uh, developed countries rather than poor countries with higher per capita income. But you also want some kind of convergence around distribution and some kind of middle class society where the, the bulk of the population are living in some reasonable level of security. And I think that's, that's these, these kind of other aspects to defining the emerging economies seem to get sort of pushed off the table a bit. So I just like to say that. And colleagues, that brings us to the end of this afternoon's session. I'd just like, on your behalf, to thank uh, Deborah, Stefan, Andy, David, and Emma for absolutely, I think, enthralling responses, but particularly to thank all of you who asked a question, all of you who wanted to ask a question. I think we got through an awful lot. So on all your behalf, shall we have a round of applause for everybody? <laughs>